This is extra practice for quiz one in Math 1341, Calculus 1. Uh, this quiz covers, this is average rate of change, prelude to instantaneous rate of change, and then part of this limits and continuity day, it's just through Monday's class, and you will see this reflected in the exercises. So let's begin with number one which is an average rate of change type problem. We have the function, the square root of x squared plus nine on the interval zero to four. Part A, we want the average rate of change of this function on this interval. If you recall this notation, change in f over change in x, this will be f of four minus f of zero, and then divided by four minus zero. Okay. These are both square roots. Well, f of four, you see we have 16 plus nine, which is 25. So this is the square root of 25. f of zero, we have zero plus nine. f of zero is the square root of nine. These numbers work out very nice. The square root of 25 is five minus three, and then this is over four. This is two over four, or one half. This is the answer to part A, the average rate of change of this function on the interval zero to four is one half. Now move on to part B, find an equation of the secant line for f of x um, on this interval. Well, we already have the slope. This is what we calculated in part A. The slope is one half. We also need a point, and we can really use either point is fine. I will use zero comma f of zero. So I'm using the point zero three. You could also use the point four comma five. This is also on this line. Now, the equation is y minus y one is m and x minus x1. This is perfectly fine. You could also write this in slope intercept if you wanted to, um, but it's perfectly fine in point slope form as I have written it here. Number two, this is from the section 1.2, the prelude to instantaneous rates of change section. We are given a particle is moving along a line, straight line with this position function. 2t plus t squared. We want to find the average velocity between t and t plus h, and then simplify until the expression is defined at h equals zero. This is this average velocity. This is the difference quotient we were discussing in class. So what we want here is the difference quotient, p of t plus h minus p of t divided by h. This, this gives, I will write, the average rate of change, um, which is average velocity in this case, but on this interval, t to t plus h. Now, if you recall how we did a few examples with these difference quotients, something like this, I would typically start with the numerator. So we just look at p of t plus h minus p of t and simplify until we get h times something. Then we can divide by h here, and um, our expression will be defined at h equals zero. So let's do this now. p of t plus h is two times t plus h plus t plus h squared. And then we subtract off p of t, which is two t plus t squared. Okay, this is 2t plus 2h. And when I multiply all of this out, I get t squared, I get 2th and h squared. And then we have a minus 2t and minus t squared, just distributing the minus sign. Now, some things will add to zero, this and this adds to zero. And then we also have this one and this one adds to zero. So we are left with 2h. We have 2th. 
And then we have h squared. Okay, this is h times something. This is h times two plus two t plus h. And so we are ready to divide by h, which is perfect. We will have something where um, we will have the average rate of change on this interval, or another way to say that is average velocity. We will have this simplified to where it is defined at h equals zero. This is h, two plus two t plus h over h. And now you see this is two plus two t plus h, okay? That's part A. Now we move into part B. We want to plug in h equals zero and find the instantaneous velocity, v of t. What happens when you take this expression and evaluate at h equals zero? You just get this part, two plus two t. So letter B, the instantaneous velocity, v of t, is two plus two t, letter B. Now we are on number three, and this is, we have moved into the limits section. We want to evaluate a few things, four things about this function f of x uh, in the graph. And everything is all centered around one, right? We want the limit, this is coming from the left at x equals one, the limit from the right, the overall limit or two-sided limit, and then we want the function value. Okay, and one, let me highlight is, right here so this is where we're interested in we want the limit from the left limit from the right two-sided limit and function value okay so limit from the left that's this one you use values less than one but approaching and you see we ask what y value is the function approaching and we see this answer is zero right if you get closer and closer to one coming in from the left um, the y values here are approaching zero. Now, limit from the right. This uses values bigger than one, but approaching. And we see what happens to the y value. Okay, well, we can see this also, right? As we approach this way, x equals one, the y values are approaching right here. Y equals minus one, minus one. Now, part C is the overall limit. Well, the limit from the left is not equal to the limit from the right. One is zero, one is minus one. And so the overall limit does not exist. And finally here, we want the function value. Well, it's here, it's filled in here. So the function value is exactly minus one. Okay. You could also think about some of these other places, for instance, at four, limit from the left, up here, at two, limit from the right, here, minus two. The function value, though, right, is one. That would be another thing to think about as you're preparing for the quiz. It's nice to look at this function at different x values. We have one more problem, but it has three parts. And for each one, we want to evaluate the limit or show that it does not exist. All of these are ones where um, we first try to evaluate. And I've mentioned this, this is our general strategy. First, try to evaluate. And um, we will realize things go wrong in all of these when we try. But what happens here? Well, you see, if you try to evaluate at three, we get nine minus nine over three minus three times two, okay, which is the square root of four. But this is zero, and this is zero, and zero times anything is zero. So if you try to evaluate, you get like this. Now, careful, this does not say the limit does not exist. It also does not say the limit exists. Zero over zero is indeterminate, and that says that we need to do something in order to figure out, does the limit exist? And if it does, what is its value? Here, what we need to do is factor the numerator. So this is a limit as t goes to three. The numerator is t minus three times t plus three. And then in the denominator, I'll leave it the same for the moment. We have the square root t 
T plus one. But now you see T minus three over T minus three right here, we can cancel this off. So we get a limit as T approaches three, we have T plus three divided by the square root of T plus one. Now, this is great because our strategy, try to evaluate, we can, right? We evaluate here, we get three plus three over the square root of four. This is defined. This allows us to calculate the limit. We get six over two, which is three. But this limit exists and is three. Letter B, we want to limit as X approaches five of this one fifth minus one over X, all divided by five minus X. Once again, if you try to evaluate, we get this indeterminate form, okay, which does not mean the limit exists. It does not mean the limit does not exist. It means you have to do something in order to determine this. I think the easiest thing to start a problem like this, because we need to do something, is let's just get a common denominator in the numerator and hopefully everything will work out. So we have a limit as X approaches five. My common denominator in the numerator is five times X. And then we will have an X here and a minus five. Okay, because you multiply this first one by X over X and you multiply this one by five over five to get this common denominator. And we all divided by here, we have five minus X. Now, maybe I will take one more step before I cancel anything. This five minus X is in the denominator of this whole fraction. If you think it'd be like five minus X over one, then you could invert and multiply and realize that this is really here, right? So I will leave the X minus five and then the five minus X goes here. But I think to make my life a little bit simpler, I'm going to factor out a minus sign. So there's a minus and then an X minus five, because I just wanna make this and this match. And I see a five minus X, I see an X minus five, and one is just minus one times the other. If I factor out this minus sign and then put this in the denominator, but now is perfect because we have X over five over X over five. And this is one. I get um, one over negative five X. And now try to evaluate, we can. So this is just minus one over 25. This is our limit, negative one over 25. This limit exists in part B and equals negative one over 25. One more, this is a limit at zero. So we take a limit as Y approaches zero of this sort of polynomial of Y divided by this other polynomial of Y. When we evaluate at zero, okay, we have seen this before, but we get this indeterminate form zero over zero. Now in this case, you notice every single term, both in the numerator and in the denominator has a Y in it. And so, this is a limit as y approaches zero. Let's factor out a y. We have y squared plus two y plus three. And then similarly, factor out a y. We have y plus one. Y over y, we may cancel off. And we have y squared plus 2y plus 3 over y plus 1. Now ask yourself, can we evaluate? Yes, we have polynomial divided by polynomial. We may evaluate at y equals 0. When we do, we get 3 over 1. Okay, this limit is 3. So all three of these limits existed, even though we had these indeterminate forms initially when we tried to evaluate. This is the end of quiz one extra practice and I thank you very much.